Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brian Yusko. I'm the Associate Dean of Academic Programs here in the College of Education and Human Services. And um, today I'm going to be talking to you about TaskStream, uh, giving you a little bit of orientation about why we use TaskStream, uh, what it's used for, and to give you some guidance about how to use it effectively. Uh, first of all, uh, just give you some information about people that you can contact if you have questions. So you have a handout with my name and my email information. So feel free to contact me if you have any questions uh, about TaskStream, especially why we use TaskStream, if you have questions about particular assignments, if you have questions um, about uh, any of the process. Uh, you can definitely contact me at any time by email and I'll respond to you. Uh, and Heather Gallagher is our coordinator of assessment and accreditation. Uh, she can help you with any of the kind of technical assistance that you might need. If you ever have any trouble uh, submitting work or if you don't see the name of your evaluator on the list of people you're supposed to submit to, um, she can help you with any of those kinds of questions. So feel free to contact her by email at any time. Um, also, I just want to make sure that you are aware that we do have a TaskStream website um, that's part of our College of Ed website. So I'm going to just skip over here for a second and show you some of the features of our TaskStream website. All right, so as you see here, this is our College of Ed website, which you can get to from the university. And over on the side here, there is a TaskStream link. So if you click on this TaskStream link, uh, there's a couple of important things. First, this gives you all the overview about how the TaskStream process works. And it gives you several resources that you can reach out to if you have any questions about TaskStream. Uh, and then if you go a little bit deeper and you click on this resources link, you'll see a whole variety of resources that are available to you. So this, this is a one way to get to the TaskStream website. Uh, we have a new and updated uh, handbook for 2018-2019, so you can download it directly from here. Uh, we have some video tutorials, uh, and we're going to be adding some video tutorials shortly. And then there are a bunch of resource documents that will be of use to you at different points throughout your program. Um, this portfolio requirements by program actually lists off all of the current requirements in the task stream portfolio. So you can click on that and you see that all of our programs are here and you can look up your program and you can see what the task stream requirements are for that program. So early childhood graduate, it shows you what you need at each of the three checkpoints. And it also shows you how to self-enroll, which we're going to do in a, in a couple minutes. Uh, the last thing which is important uh, for everyone to realize is that there's this timeline. We put, for every semester we update the dates, and these are the dates uh, that, will, uh, that uh, important things are due in TaskStream. Uh, so for anybody who's doing a checkpoint this semester, it will show you that your checkpoint self-analysis, uh, you're going to be getting information about it on October the 12th, and those are going to be due on November the 2nd. Uh, and then that whole process of uh, evaluation and any resubmissions will be completed by November the 30th. Um, for people that are doing student teaching, uh, this also tells you when your EdTPA is due to be submitted uh, and when it will be assessed by. So those dates are uh, something that get updated each semester. Uh, the other important thing that I want to point out to you is that if you are writing a self-analysis, we have an example of what we consider to be a good self-analysis up here. So if you want to know what people write, what, they, uh, what kinds of things we're looking for, uh, this is a good resource that you can access. So, okay. Uh, moving on from here. So, I think it's important for people to understand a little bit about why we use the task stream system. Uh, sometimes people feel like it's an add-on to our coursework and it feels like an extra step that people have to do to submit their work. Uh, but there are some important reasons why we do it and some important, um, uh, some things that are helpful to you as a candidate and also helpful to us as a college. So uh, essentially, task stream serves as a portfolio process. Right? It's a process where we are asking candidates to submit work that demonstrates their ability through complex, robust types of tasks that mirror what you're going to be doing as a teacher. Uh, 
by having people submit portfolio work throughout their whole program, what we're doing is we're helping you to document that you are able to do the next steps in the program. So we use this as a way to, to track your readiness for moving forward in the program. And finally, at the end of the program, we determine, we use the, pro the process to determine your readiness for being endorsed for a license in Ohio. Uh, and this is something we've had in place since 2001, but back in 2001, we used to do it as big uh, loose leaf portfolio binders. Now we just have it electronically. So it's really the same process, it's just that we've moved it into the more electronic uh, age. Uh, the third bullet point you'll see, um, by having a common template for everybody, what that does for us is that it allows us to make sure that everybody who completes a program does the same key assignments through the course of their program and they are held to the same expectations and they are assessed using the same rubrics. Right? So when you have a program like ours where uh, we have a lot of part-time instructors and full-time instructors all teaching multiple sections of the same course, since TaskStream has the directions for the assignment and the rubrics for the assignment, we, it makes sure that um, every instructor is using the same assignment and they're grading it in the same way. So it helps all the students to make sure that they have a consistent quality experience. The fourth bullet point talks about reflection. So we believe at Cleveland State that a teacher is a reflective, responsive practitioner. And so we're doing everything that we can to try to promote reflection on your teaching practice throughout the course of your program. And uh, when you become a teacher in the state of Ohio, you're going to be held accountable to, be, to demonstrate your proficiency in the Ohio standards for the teaching profession. So at key points in the portfolio process, you're going to be asked to reflect on your progress in relation to the Ohio standards for the teaching profession. So that's going to help you become familiar with the Ohio standards. And it's also going to help when you do an interview so that then when, the, when principals or search committees ask you about the Ohio standards, you're going to be comfortable talking about them and giving examples of your proficiency. So we believe that this is part of the process that will help you become a more proficient interviewer or interviewee. Uh, the fifth bullet point talks about uh, storage for key portfolio artifacts. So it's often the case that I hear students talking to me about um, the, uh, a laptop that was lost or a hard drive that was fried, uh, a laptop that was stolen or broken. Uh, when that happens, you stand to lose all of your work. But if you have put your work into, into task stream, then at least for those key artifacts, they're sitting out there. They're on the web. You can always retrieve them. And if anybody ever asks you for this work back, you can go out to TaskStream and get it back. So it's a kind of a safety mechanism for all the portfolios, uh, for all the candidates uh, to have uh, storage for their portfolio artifacts. And then the last thing is that as a college faculty, we want to model what we expect of you as a teacher candidate. So we expect that you're going to be using student data to uh, reflect on your own teaching performance and your own success as a teacher. Well, in the same way, we also are reflecting on our performance as a college faculty. So by looking at the data that we gather in the task stream system, it's helping us to reflect on our own performance and figure out what are the things we're doing well as a faculty and what are the things that we need to improve on. And we're using this on a constant basis to try to set goals for ourselves and to try to continue to improve our teacher prep programs. Okay, so getting started. So at the beginning of everybody's program, we use your tech fee funds to initiate your uh, task stream account. Uh, you're going to be set up with a task stream account at the moment when you take the first course that has a task stream requirement. After three semesters, we send out an email that notifies you that your account is going to be inactivated. Uh, and then at that point, it's up to you to renew. Um, if you're not sure whether you have a task stream account, uh, what you should do is you should go to the task stream login page. And I'll just show you the task stream login page over here. Go to the task stream login page. And for your username, you should use your CSU Vikes email account. 
That's how we set up everybody's initial account. And um, you would, at, at the time that your account was created, you would have received a, an email from TaskStream notifying you that the account was created for you. Um, sometimes people don't notice it because it comes from the email called notification at taskstream.com. Um, in a few cases, we've had people that, um, that that notification was sent to their spam or their junk mailbox. So you can always look in your spam or your junk mail or your clutter box to see if that uh, notification was put in there. Uh, but if you can't find it, you can always use your Vikes email and then click on um, forgot login right here. And then, that, and then it will send you a link to the email address you have on file so that you can reset your password. And I think that's what you just did, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so before you, you try to pay for your own license or do anything like that, use your Vikes email to, act, to uh, log into your account. If you have technical questions also, there is a task stream helpline on the PowerPoint uh, slides. Um, and you can call them at most hours of the day, all the way, I think, up until midnight every night, and they'll help you get logged in. So let me talk a little bit about portfolio structure. So throughout the course of your program, you're going to use three different types of portfolio in TaskStream. Uh, the first type is called, we call it a checkpoint template. It's called a checkpoint template because it collects requirements that you do at three different checkpoints in your program. Uh, the first checkpoint is the checkpoint that happens before your practicum or before internship one or apprentice teaching one. The second checkpoint is the checkpoint that happens just before you do student teaching. And then the third checkpoint is the checkpoint that you're going to do at the end of your program uh, in order to earn your license. So all programs have either two or th most of them have three checkpoints and some of them have two. Uh, but you always have to do a checkpoint before student teaching, and uh, always have to do a checkpoint at the end of student teaching. Um, in the checkpoint template, it includes all the requirements that you're going to have to submit through your coursework. Right? So that's why it's course-based requirements. And the complete list of course requirements is found on that website that I showed you earlier, when you clicked on the list of requirements by program. Um, this semester, we've rolled out new templates, and we're asking everybody to log into those new templates. And I'm going to show you that process on the next slide. Um, so you're, what we're asking this semester for everybody to do is to use the self-enrollment codes uh, that, that are on your list of requirements by program to enroll into the new template and to um, submit work in all of your assignments so that you can receive credit for anything that you've already submitted in your old template. It's a pretty simple process, but we just want to make sure that everybody gets, gets it taken care of. So that's the first type, checkpoint templates. The second type is an OFS template. That's the Office of Field Services. So in the OFS template, that is what you're going to use when you do your final year of, of field work, your practicum, your internship, your apprentice teaching, and your student teaching. The OFS template will also be added on. You'll self-enroll into that, and it's going to be added on um, when you start those experiences. So OFS will let you know how to enroll into those templates. And the OFS template is the place where you are going to record all of your, the observations that, that are done for you. Your supervisor is going to evaluate you there. Uh, that's where your mentor teacher will submit evaluations. Um, and you'll submit some of the paperwork that you need to submit for your practicum and your student teaching experiences. So although those things are not considered to be the key assessments that we use in the checkpoint templates, they are things that track the experience that you're doing out in the field. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK, so there's the field part, and there's the course-based part. And then the last type of a template is the EdTPA template. The EdTPA is a large assignment that you're going to do during your final semester at Cleveland State. It involves uh, multiple pieces and parts of planning, teaching, videotaping, and assessing student work. So you're going to learn a lot more about that when you do student teaching. Uh, but that you, when, you, when you do the student teaching, you're going to add also the EdTPA template. So in the end, you are going to have three templates that you're working with throughout the course of your program. So now, the transition to the new template. So I'm going to go online, and I'm going to show you what this transition will look like. It's pretty straightforward, but it takes just a little bit of effort on your part. So 
your first step is that you're going to want to um, sign into your account. Now, I have a lot of uh, programs on my home page. You're probably only going to have one. But let's say that you're in the early childhood graduate program, right? So you have this early childhood graduate um, template. And you want to go into the new grad early childhood graduate template. So you need to, first of all, find out what that self-enrollment code is. And you go over here. And you see that the self-enrollment code is ECG-18. Right? So you're going to want to add that to your template. And the way you do it is you go to the bottom. You click this button that says Enter Code. And then you enter the code, ECG-18. You search for the program. And that is the grad early childhood for academic year 18. So you go ahead and enroll. Then you can start working on your program. And now you can see that all the assignments that are listed here are the assignments that you're going to have to show that you've completed before you move on. So the checkpoint one, these are things you have to complete before you do your practicum. So let's say that you um, have already done your project plan. This, this is, comes from ECE 501. So if you've already taken ECE 501 and you've already had your assignment assessed in ECE 501, all you have to do is you click on this text and image box. And in the box, you're going to indicate, I completed this assignment in my early childhood graduate template. That's it. You just type in a note. You hit Save and Return. And once you save, and re save it there, you're going to need to submit your work. So you click on su Submit. And you'll see that there's a pop-up box here that lists all of the people that can evaluate in this program. And you want to send it to Manager Cleveland State. That's the administrative account that manages all of the administrative work that needs to be done in the templates. So after I click Manager Cleveland State, I'm going to submit this for evaluation. And I just want to show you one other piece of this, which is now you see that on my task stream screen, it's taken me to my scores and results tab. So when I'm looking at my scores and results tab, I can see that the project plan was submitted to Cleveland State Manager, and it gives me the date that I submitted it. Right? Now, let's suppose that I submitted it incorrectly. If I submitted the wrong thing, or if I didn't really want to submit it, or if I forgot to attach a file or something, I can always cancel that submission. And it asks me if I want to really confirm. And yes, I want to undo it. And once I do that, and you see now it says here that I've canceled it. I can either re-edit it or I can resubmit it. But it, it, is, it has not been submitted. So you are allowed to cancel any submission um, up until the time when the evaluator opens it up. So as soon as the evaluator opens it up, it's locked to you and you cannot cancel the submission. But if you just, if you, like if you submitted it right now and you knew that your instructor wasn't going to be looking at it until tomorrow night, you would have until tomorrow night to cancel it and resubmit it. It's, it's up to whenever they open it up. If the instructor opens it up, then they can choose to just evaluate it or they can choose to send it back to you. If they've sent it back to you, then when you go to your scores and results, it will, in this line under actions, it will say um, resubmit work. or re it'll, There'll be a button there that will allow you to um, edit your work and then resubmit it. It'll say it's sent back for resubmission. That's how you transition to the new template. So let me just show you one other piece of this, which is, OK. So let's say I'm working in my grad early childhood template. If I am, let's see, so I'm going to edit my work. 
So if normally when you sub I think you, you've already used the system before, right, to do this. So I think you already know how to submit an attachment, right? For most of your assignments, you're going to submit an attachment. You're going to upload it from the computer. You're going to pick a file. Ah, I don't have any files on this computer. All right, and once I upload it, I'm going to go ahead and submit it. All right, so I've, now you see, once again, I've submitted it. And we have this new feature. Some instructors will require this, um, but we're trying to make sure that uh, there's academic integrity in Task Stream. So you can request an originality report, which basically is like Turnitin, turnitin.com. It checks to see that your work is original. It, does a, uh, it looks to see how much of your work is original. So if your instructor asks you to do this, all you have to do is just request a report. Oh. And then after, it'll give you some period of time, and then you can click on the originality report, and it will tell you how much of your submission is original and how much of it is not original. So this is what instructors can use also to make sure that there's no kind of issues of plagiarism and things like that. Um, in my case, um, it's still being analyzed by Turnitin, so I can't see the originality report. The last thing I want to show you is this history and comments button. So if, if you, let's suppose that you talk to your instructor and you say, um, I've submitted my work last week. And they say to you, well, I can't see it. Right? You can go in from your side. Well, for one thing, you can see when it was submitted and who it was submitted to. But the other thing you can do is you can look at the history. So by clicking on the history, it will show you with date and time exactly what has happened with your submission. So this will show when it got submitted, when it got canceled, when it got submitted again. It, when it's evaluated, it will show you that it was evaluated. And you'll be able to click in here to see the evaluation report. Um, and that's also the place where the instructor will give you feedback if they want you to re revise or resubmit your work. So that, that, uh, that history button is a really valuable button to you because that's the way you can always check to see um, any feedback that's been given to you. All right, and you see where those buttons are? There's the work button, and here's the scores and results button. Basically, if you can do that, then you can navigate task stream. I mean, that submit work, view the results, um, view the history, right? I mean, that, those are all the things that you'll need to be able to do. And in the end, when you're all done, what you want to see, if you look at your scores and results, you want to see straight down the line that every one of these says meets requirement, meets requirement, meets requirement. And as long as everything in the checkpoint one meets requirement, that means you pass checkpoint one. So these are some special situations. What should you do if you had a course that you didn't take at Cleveland State? If that's the case, then all you have to do is just like I just showed you. You just click in to the assignment. You open up a text and image box. And you type in the box, I completed this course at Tri-C. And then you, should, you can list the course you took at Tri-C. You can list when you took it. Um, and you can upload your, um, your checklist, your program checklist or your program study that shows that you took the course somewhere else. And then we'll give you credit for it. So you get credit for anything you completed in a course that has a test room requirement if you took it somewhere else. You do the exact same thing if you have a course that got waived for some reason, like if you waived your practicum or you waived your student teaching. You just put in a note, a text and image box that indicates that your, pr that your course was waived along with a letter proving that the course was waived, and then we just give you credit for it. Uh, if for some reason you have submitted an artifact and it was sent back to you and it does not meet the requirements, hopefully that doesn't happen to you. But if it does, your first step is you need to contact your instructor uh, and find out what the, pr well, you can look for the, at the scores and results to see what the results were. But then you should check with uh, your instructor to see uh, when they want you to resubmit this work by. Because you, you're not going to be able to pass the checkpoint until you meet the requirements for every artifact. So if something does not meet the requirements, 
it means you're going to need to fix it. Now, if this happened several semesters ago and you still need to, and it's still showing up as not meeting requirements, then you should contact me directly. And, we, and I will work with you to figure out what the strategy will be for you to address this, uh, to, to address this issue. Uh, if it doesn't happen at the time you finish the course, it, ideally it should happen by the time you finish the course. But if it doesn't, uh, then you, we're going to have to figure out a way for you to address it at a checkpoint. And it might mean that you submit additional work to, um, to remediate any artifacts that don't meet requirements. And then the last thing is if for some reason you have submitted an artifact and it was not assessed, your first uh, approach should be to contact the instructor of the course. As long as you, well, check to make sure it was submitted correctly. If it was submitted correctly, then contact your instructor and just send them a polite email that says, I'm going through a checkpoint. I need to make sure that this artifact is assessed. Can you please assess it? And in almost all cases, instructors will just get right in and then they will just complete that assessment. Sometimes uh, they missed one or something like that. Uh, if you try to contact an instructor and you don't hear back, your next recourse is to contact me and I will reach out on your behalf to contact the instructor. So we will work to make sure that any unassessed artifacts get assessed for you. All right. So now getting on to the checkpoints. Okay. So when you are ready to start a checkpoint, uh, it's usually going to be it's going to be the semester before you go into your practicum or your internship, or the semester before you go into student teaching, or the end of your student teaching semester. When you are doing one of those checkpoints, you are going to get on our list by making sure that you apply through the Office of Field Services for that major field experience. So you have to apply through the Office of Field Services by September 15th for a spring experience, or by February 15th for a fall experience. Uh, and once you're on the list, then we will uh, pair you up with a designated uh, checkpoint assessor. And you will get a letter from me. I'm going to send you a letter by email and at the address that we have on file for you, which is your campus net, uh, which is the address that's in campus net. And it's going to go to your house and it's going to notify you who your checkpoint assessor is and it's going to give you all the instructions for how to do this checkpoint. Um, there are two parts to the checkpoint. So one part is that you have to meet the requirements for all course-based requirements in your checkpoint. Um, and that's just a matter of making sure that you've taken all the courses and that you've properly submitted everything and that everything has been assessed and that everything meets requirements. So that's one part of the checkpoint. And the other part of the checkpoint is the self-analysis part. So the self-analysis part, in this task, we are asking that you reflect on your competence in relation to each one of the Ohio standards for the teaching profession. It's going to be a form that you fill out and you're going to be asked to um, reflect on your strengths and your areas for improvement in, rela in relation to each of the seven. Uh, in order to reflect on that, we ask that you upload what we call a choice artifact. So a choice artifact should be some document that reflects your competence in the standards. Usually it's something like a lesson plan or a unit plan or a series of lesson plans. Sometimes it can be a research paper, but it should be something that is substantial, something that really demonstrates as many of these, um, of, of these standards as possible. And then when you write your self-reflection, you're going to write your self-reflection and you're going to use evidence from that choice artifact uh, to show that you've got strengths in the areas of the Ohio standards. So for example, if you write a lesson plan and in your lesson plan you sh talk about um, connecting with students' prior knowledge or experiences, that relates to Ohio standard number one about students. So when you write about Ohio standard number one, you're basically going to say, um, in the lesson plan I uploaded as a choice artifact, I've developed it. Um, to connect with my students' prior knowledge and background, uh, uh, their interests and their prior knowledge and their background and their experiences. And that relates to Ohio standard number one. So it's sh making the connection between the artifact and the standard. That's what we're looking for you to do, is to be able to connect between the artifact and the standard. Um, and then we're going to ask that you make a connection with research and theory. So you've been learning research and theory in all of your coursework. 
And we want you, as you're going through, to also make references to authors that you've read or ideas that you've learned that help you think about that particular standard. So if you're talking about child development and you are, you've learned about Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, you can talk about how that has helped to inform the lesson plans that you wrote and the way that you uh, connected up with the uh, students prior experiences. Right? So uh, we, this is not a research paper. We're not asking you to have a reference list. We're not asking you to put it in APA style. But what we are asking is that you recite specific theories or specific authors um, by name to, so that it's evidence that, in fact, you have learned some things from your coursework. Right? So that's a piece of that. And I talked about the evidence. Uh, and the last piece of your self-analysis is that you are going to identify the one Ohio standard that you feel is your weakest and come up with some specific strategies that you want to use to try to improve in that area. The goal here is just to be as specific as you can so that we know that you're always thinking about how to grow as a professional. So that's the self-analysis. And the due dates for that are listed on the task stream website that I talked about earlier. Um, but generally speaking, uh, they are due around the end of October for the fall checkpoints. And in the spring, they are due sometime around the end of March. So you, you will submit them to the, your designated checkpoint assessor, uh, and then they will be assessed within a two-week time frame. And if there's a problem with it or if there's some issue, then it'll be sent back to you for resubmission. We, uh, we usually allow at least w one revision for every student if there's any problems with their checkpoint self -analysis. I would just invite you, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me or Heather by email. Um, and hopefully this has been of uh, some value to you. Mm -hmm.